We ask all this in the precious name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I was 13 the first time I went skiing. I went with my school. They recommended I get the lesson, so I did. And like every 13-year-old boy, after the lesson and a couple of times down the slopes, I thought, I've got it all now. I'm an expert. So, of course, I went. Where would you go? When you're an expert, where do you go? You go to the expert slope. Went to the expert slope. That's consistent thinking, right? I got a little way down the expert slope. I was doing just fine. I was reassured that my self-assessment was flawless about my expertness. Then I came to a bit of plateau. And as I got to the edge of the plateau, below that plateau, right at my feet, was a slope that absolutely made my knees shake and my legs get weak. It seemed to be a cliff. And this brought all sorts of turmoil to me. I was gripped with fear. There was no way to go back. There was no way I could go back up the portion I'd just come down. And then I'm standing there, I'm watching others go down the cliff and thinking to myself, this is impossible. How are they doing that? They must have superpowers. And, but also saying to myself, I don't want to be a coward. And I'm staring at this slope and I'm thinking, I can't believe anyone's doing this. Is anyone watching me right now? I'm frightened to death, but I don't want to be afraid finally get myself together and I start to slalom down the slope. But I was only able to keep my composure for something like maybe 10 seconds. I don't even know if it was that. The speed picked up so quickly that I couldn't get to go side to side anymore. There was none of that. My snowplow that I learned in my half hour lesson was not working. And I couldn't steer myself in any meaningful manner. So I just went straight down that hill, and my only priority was to keep from falling so I would not die on this hill. I absolutely felt like I was going Mach 2. If you've seen the new Top Gun movie, I was absolutely going faster than these fighter pilots ever went. My face was distorted from the G-forces. I remember yelling to anyone that got even close to my path, look out, get out of the way. Complete lack of composure. (laughs) Coolness out the window. I made it down safely without falling. I regained my 13-year-old composure. I stayed away from anything resembling a black diamond the rest of the day and for most of the rest of my life here. (laughs) But that has forever become a picture for me of what a slippery slope looks like and especially the slippery slope of sin. I began down the slope thinking I was in control. Pride kept me from turning back or asking for help. I kept going even though it wasn't fun anymore because I thought I had to keep going. The whole situation accelerated way faster than I ever intended or imagined, and it was complete chaos by the end. I was completely out of control and completely under the control of gravity and that slope. My well-being and the well-being of everyone near me was in danger. But God kept his hand on me and delivered me, and I was humbled. Really, I was humiliated. And I grew a bit wiser. Five kings of Israel are going to show us the slippery slope of sin today. So let's put it like this. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Let's look at these kings, okay? The first king was an inconsequential king an inconsequential king. You may remember two weeks ago, we saw how badly things were going in the northern kingdom of Israel, just terrible idolatry and rebellion against the Lord. So then last week, scriptures changed the channel to, so that now we're watching the southern kingdom of Judah. Were things going any better there? Well, not really. So now we change the channel back to Israel. Let's check back in on them. 
And we're going to be focused on that northern kingdom for a while. And this section kicks off with a short report of, of five, five short reports of five Israelite kings in succession. It's a depression, depressing story. It's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. Kings then, as they are now, where you find a king in the world today, not only rule, but they represent their people. They're representative heads of their country. In our time, we're very familiar with polls. We talk about our representatives, but we don't talk about them as kings, or at least we're not supposed to. And they are, our representatives are supposed to represent the values of the people at large, the representatives. But with kings, it's different. What the kings think is what the country is. What the kings say is what the, ki- what the country does. What the kings believe is what the country believes. They're representative. And so if a king believed that many gods should be worshipped and that it was beneficial to burn infants in sacrifice to a particular god, then that is what the people did. And that's how other nations viewed those people. They were representative heads, but they were also examples. As with any leader to this very day, what the leader does gets emulated and progresses among the people usually in a worse way than what the leader has done, in a more broken way than what the leader has done. And so if a leader helps himself to the coffers, why wouldn't those he leads consider the same action fair game? If it's just for you, it's just for me. If it's fair for you, it's fair for me. If a leader is not truthful, so those who follow the leader will be liars as well. And this is what we see in the Scriptures, and this is what we see in our lives to this day. And let's read about the first of these five kings. I'm calling him inconsequential king. 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 25 to 32. 1 Kings 15, 25 to 32. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his fathers and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. Baasha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha struck him down at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. For Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. So Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And as soon as he was king, he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left in the house of Jeroboam, not one that breathed until he had destroyed it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. It was for the sins of Jeroboam that he sinned, and that he made Israel to sin, and because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. Now notice that the only notable thing about Nadab is that God's wrath for his father's sins, for Jeroboam's sins, were executed on him like the prophet had said. Nothing else. Nadab reigns two years. He keeps the status quo. He changes nothing. He keeps on sinning just like his father, Jeroboam. Two years and he's done. There's no notes of God speaking to him or even sending a prophet to him. He changes nothing. There's no buildings that are reported. There are no battles that are reported. Really nothing about him is notable. He's inconsequential. And it makes you wonder, what would the Lord have done? What would have been been said about Nadab had he humbled himself before the Lord? Had he looked at his father and saw the sin and heard the prophecy and said, I don't want to die? and turned and repented. And so many Christians talk today about doing big things for the kingdom, but know this. Sin makes you inconsequential in the work of God. It puts you on the sidelines. It takes you out of the way for God to use you in the way that that you could be used. Doing work in the work of God, being part of what He's doing, being part of someone coming to Christ, maybe being the person that shares Christ with someone who ultimately the Spirit of God is drawing and God saves. That's a glorious thing to be a part of. Being part of something like youth camp and serving or serving the church day in and day out 
is a glorious thing. When you look around, you see the work that God is doing all around you. You see the people of God gathered, hearing the word of God, worshiping the Lord. You see baptism, people coming to the Lord's table, God answering prayers. It's glorious to be part of the work of God. But know this, sin will sideline you. Repentance for sin and righteousness, however, puts you in the sight of the Lord. Look at Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. That's the repentant. And saves the crushed in spirit. And then 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Let's move to look at our second king. And this is boring king. Boring king. When I was young and I would say, I'm bored. Don't you love that? Kids say, I'm bored. My father would always say, only boring people get bored. Any of your parents say that to you? Man, that would irritate me. So the fact is, I was probably more irritating to my gracious and patient father than, than his statement was to me. And by the way, I love saying this to my kids now. Only boring people get bored. It's a, it's a great way to sort of insult your kids at the same time. Teach them a principle. <laughs> and it's true. What it did was that it connected my words to my attitudes and actions. There, there was a moral quality that I didn't understand as a kid. There's a choice that I was making to what I was saying. Boring wasn't simply happening to me as if it was someone else's fault, like the people I'm saying it to, or God's fault. Like, come on, I should be entertained right now. I should be enjoying myself. No, it was the way I was approaching the life that God had given to me as a gift. That's hard to see that when you're being so inward and selfish. And it requires repentance and brokenness and humility to recognize, wait a minute, I'm bored? Wait a minute, what has the Lord called me to right now? Let me give myself to that. I'm not sure, though, if we can be blamed when we look at Baasha's reign and simply conclude, okay, this is the same old, same old. Look at verses 33, chapter 15, verse 33 and following. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, began to reign over all Israel at Tirzah. And he reigned 24 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which, which he made Israel to sin. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, Baasha, saying, Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And any one of his who's, who dies in the field of the birds, uh, who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Does that sound familiar? Verse 5. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried at Tirzah, and Ella his son reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house, both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. God gave Baasha 24 years to reign. That's the longest of any of the kings, of any of the five kings that we see in this list. God used Baasha to punish Jeroboam's house as God had prophesied about Jeroboam. God gave Baasha in those 24 years opportunity to set up his own house, to start a new dynasty, to start a righteous line. But what does he do with it? He takes it easy. He does exactly what was exemplified for him before. He does evil in the sight of the Lord. He acts just like Jeroboam. He doesn't change anything from Jeroboam's ways, which is ironic, right? Because God used Baasha to destroy Jeroboam for the very sins that Baasha is now doing. There's this theme in, in the Old Testament where the Israelites are supposed to be different than the people of, of Canaan. When they get into Canaan, 
They're just supposed to destroy all that sinful, evil rebellion against God, and they're supposed to be different than the world. But what happens is they keep going back and doing the very things that the pagans before them had done. And the same can be true of us. Lord, help us. We we should be different than the world. There should be parts. There need to be times. I'm not saying you to be, I'm not, I'm not calling us to just be obnoxious for no reason or different in, in ways that, that aren't biblically sensible. But there should be things in our life that when the world looks at, we're doing them because of righteousness sake. And the world looks at it and says, that's weird. That's peculiar. That's strange. Because a little secret about that is deep down they're saying, that's right. That's right. But if we do the same things they do, we give them nothing to, to be upended about. We give them nothing to consider. We're just like them. You see how dull-minded sin makes someone, how predictable, how non-dynamic. Baasha is pathetically walking in the ultimate self-fulfilling prophecy for over two decades, and he doesn't even realize it. The same could happen to us. The years go by. He could have established righteousness in Israel. He could have turned them from their wayward path. He could have pointed their eyes to the God that had given him the kingdom. He could have appointed Israel to salvation in the Lord. He could have established his throne. But he does none of that. And so God says, okay, you want the same old, same old? You got it. And the Lord sends a word to Baasha that the very same judgment that came on Jeroboam, whom God used Baasha to judge, will come on him. His dynasty will quickly come to an end, and so will his family. Do you see your life? Do you see your days as opportunity, as the opportunity that it is, as the opportunity that God means it to be? He's given it to you as a gift. What will you do? What are you doing with the life God's given you, with the days that you walk in? If you're walking in sin, know that sin is stealing from you the glorious and dynamic chance to bring Christ's glory with righteousness and your willing obedience that is peculiar to the world. Don't let the days slip away in a stupor of sin. Instead, turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Here comes our third king. And he's the drunk king, the drunk king. Now, given what was prophesied against Jeroboam's house and how Baasha fulfilled the wrath of the Lord, and given that the same judgment was prophesied against Baasha's house, you might think that Baasha's son would put a few things together and be alert and on the lookout. You might think that. Let's see. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 8 through 14. 1 Kings 16, 8 through 14. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Allah, the son of Baasha, began to reign over Israel in Tirzah, and he reigned two years. But his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. When he was at Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the household in Tirzah, Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. When he began to reign, uh, that's Ella, that is. When he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on his throne, he, excuse me, I'm sorry, that was <laughs> uh, Zimri. When he began to reign, as soon as he, be, what am I doing here? Yeah, okay. Uh, as soon as he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on his throne, he struck down all the house of Baasha. He did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Ella his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Ella and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? No, Ella is not on the lookout. 
He misses the pattern. It's obvious it's right in front of him. Sin has progressed and so dulled his conscience that even though God is on the hunt for his life, and that's quite a fearful thought, he's in the the, the crosshairs of God. Even though that's the case, he's, what's he doing? He's drinking himself drunk. All he wants is escape and pleasure. All he wants is the lack of pain. And so God uses his servant, uh, Ella's servant, that is, to fulfill his prophetic judgment against Ella. And that is an end of Baasha's dynasty. Be aware, brothers and sisters, sin has this dulling, stupefying effect. It, sin makes us stupid. It interrupts logic and reason. It closes our eyes and blinds us to the what's right in front of us. Things that others can see very easily and clearly all of a sudden seems very confusing to us. That's the effect of sin. It makes us unaware of the things that we ought to be most aware of and with devastating consequence. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Here comes our fourth king. He's a doomed king. One wonders what glorious visions Zimri had in mind when he assassinated his king. When he spilled Ella's blood and his family's blood, he probably thought that all Israel would come and thank him and love him and serve him. He must have believed that they would come over to support him and ultimately be submissive to him. Surely he has some anticipation before he takes this bold move, some anticipation of success, right? But when you live by the sword and you're blinded by sin, you die by the sword. And when you don't trust God, you ultimately face ruin. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 15 to 20. Take a look at chapter 16, verse 15. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Tirzah. Now the troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the troops who were encamped heard it and said, Zimri has conspired, and he has killed the king. Therefore all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. So Omri went up from Gibbethon, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire and died because of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin, which he committed, making Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and the conspiracy that he made, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? What a sad story. Death and destruction all around. Political intrigue, cunning and shrewdness. And that is what sin brings to us. Did you note that Zimri reigned for only seven days? Seven days. That has to be the shortest reign of any king in Israel. Possibly the shortest reign of any king in world history, though there probably was a king that reigned even less, maybe just a few hours, who knows. When you can't make it to the second week as king, that's a problem. You know you're doomed. But do you notice that he receives the same condemnation from the Lord as kings that reigned for much longer? Verse 19 shows us that he died because of of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam. And, And look at this. And for his sin which he committed, making Israel to sin. You can almost think that that's not a fair assessment. How could he make Israel to sin in just seven days? He only ruled for seven days. Why are you holding him responsible? But that's really at the heart of it. Zimri's rebellion did not come from a desire to honor the Lord. God does use evil people to punish evil people. He uses evil people to bring about consequence and punishment. And that's what happened here. Zimri, who doesn't love the Lord, is used by God to punish Baasha's family. And he must have brought along at least the people of Tirzah and the chariots, the the portion of the chariots that he was over. He must have brought along conspirators with him, making Israel to sin. 
His plan was conceived in sin. It was executed in sin. It involved other Israelites in, in, in his sin. Can you see that the snowball of sin keeps getting bigger and bigger and it ends in doom for this king? Even in death, Zimri rebels. Burning the king's house over his head is like saying, if I can't have the king's house, no one can have the king's house. And by burning himself in such dramatic fashion, he's defying the Lord as well. He's saying, I'm going out on my own terms. No eye to God, no repentance, no brokenness, no humility, no recognition of his folly and foolishness, and maybe he had misstepped. We can do that too in our sin. See, that's, that's the temptation. Whenever we're in sin, be sure of this. When you're in sin, be sure of this. Your pride is going to justify you. You're going to find ways to say, no, I'm right. I'm right. And if I'm not right, I don't care. And I'll just burn this whole thing down right over my own head. Be certain. That is what you'll be tempted to do. You see, if he had turned to the Lord, even then, he would have had the chance to at least bring glory to God in his death. God's merciful to all of us, to the, the worst sinners that we know. Whenever someone turns from sin and turns to the Lord, they know the mercy of God. Sin ends in doom, my friends. Do not play around with it. Do not let it hang around. It can harden you to the point where you revel in your own prideful doom. Zimri will still face God in the end, and he will answer for that arrogant, rebellious way that he died. We're going to face God too. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. Let's take a look at that fifth king, last but not least, evil king. And I trust you can see that the snowball of sin, that slippery slope, as you look at those five points, those five kings, inconsequential, boring, drunk, doomed, evil, it got worse and worse. The whole debacle we read about here leads to another division among Israel, a civil war among Israel, another civil war among Israel. It gets worse and worse as the sin gets worse and worse. Look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 21 and following. 1 Kings 16, 21. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people that followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died. There's a sad fellow. That's what he gets. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols." Now the rest of the acts of Omri that he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, reigned in his place. Omri ends up reigning for 12 years, so he had over a decade to reign. But unlike the inconsequential king and the boring king and so on and so forth, Omri leads the people of Israel in more evil than those who were before him, than all those who were before him. That's quite a distinction. Those previous kings were evil, but he's even more evil. The trajectory of more and more evil will be seen as we go further in Kings, but it's a devastating summary statement of this man. What is that more and more evil that he does? 
Well, when Jeroboam set up the golden calves and, and lured the people of Israel into idolatry, he did so for political reasons that at least we can understand. It was still wrong, but we get it. And further, he was still calling God, the God of Israel, he was calling God, God. But apparently, Omri leads Israel into more idolatry, more immorality, more violence, more injustice. Israel has become a brutal place. There appears to be no honor in the lineage of the kings. Instead, the kingship is determined by one thing, brutal force. Omri goes on to build a legacy for his insurrection against the Lord. He builds the city of Samaria because the palace of Tirzah had been burned down. Samaria becomes the seat of power for Omri's dynasty. And Omri's sons will be even more malevolent than himself. And they will go on to be noted as the most vile kings of Israel. My brothers and sisters, depravity is never content. Just as it increases in the world if left unchecked, just as it increases in our society if left unchecked, so it increases in our hearts if left unconfronted. And if we continue to lie to ourselves about sin, then it will take on more and more mutinous forms. Do not let that happen. Let us humble ourselves and turn to our Lord Jesus Christ. He can heal broken vessels. Jesus is humble and lowly. He welcomes our repentance. He gives grace to the humble. He meets us in our tears and binds up our hearts and causes us to stand. His mercy is new every morning. It's new this morning. He will make us firm to the end. Turn to Christ now because sin's slippery slope accelerates and intensifies destruction. In just a moment, I'm going to give the benediction, and we'll depart after some time in fellowship. Usually after the benediction, people fellowship with one another. It's a glorious noise to hear, a glorious thing to behold. But before we go, think again about that city of Samaria, built to become the seat of Omri's power, a city born in revolt against the Lord, a pagan city, the opposite of Jerusalem. But many years later, about eight centuries later, in a town in the region of Samaria, not far from that city, a broken woman called the Samaritan woman goes to get water at the well. And while she's there, she encounters the light of the world. The God whom Omri should have been worshiping the God whom Omri should have gone to Jerusalem to worship, should have pointed all the people of Israel to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, that God comes out of His throne room, travels to Samaria, and meets a woman at the well. And when she questioned Him, He said, that if you knew the gift of God and who, that, who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have had, he went to her, he said, give me a drink. He said, he said, if you knew who that was that's asking that, you would say to him, give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water and Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, meaning the water of the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sin is devastating and, in a sense, seems to have a life of its own. We should say it has a death of its own. It wreaks havoc on our lives and in our souls, but there is a greater one, and He gives a life that is greater than sin. He gives a grace that overcomes sin. He gives a life that, that can defeat sin. He gives eternal life in His name. Turn away from sin. Turn again to your Savior. He will save you from the slippery slope. He will put you on solid ground before Him. 
and keep you safe in him until we see his face. Would you please agree with me in prayer? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you for sending the Son. We thank you and we praise you. Cause every heart to trust him and turn to him. Lord, you know your people. Search us, Lord, and wherever there is sin, bring repentance so that none of us are caught on that slippery slope that accelerates and intensifies. But save us, Lord. Save us again. Save us from ourselves. Save us from our sin. Let us delight in and rejoice in walking with you. We ask this for each of us and for the church 